Professor James Strickler. Welcome to this lecture about Chapter 3, British North America, in the American history textbook, American Yap. This chapter begins with a section concerning slavery. Slavery was an integral feature of what was known as the Atlantic world system, which dominated commerce over a couple of centuries during the time in which the European colonies were founded in the New World. That system, the Atlantic system, was based on an economic system called mercantilism. We discuss this in chapter two. Mercantilism is a system in which uh, countries, in this case European countries, establish colonies overseas from which they can extract resources such as lumber, fur, gold, and silver. They carry these resources back to the mother country where they are processed into manufactured goods which are then sold back to people living in the colonies. In this way, the mother country extracts more wealth out of the colonies than it returns to them, and that enables them to have a rich treasury for the country. This is a way for the mother country to become rich at the expense of the colonies. When the European company, countries founded colonies in the New World, one of the things that happened as an unintentional result of that was mass depopulation. Diseases brought by Europeans, such as smallpox, killed huge swaths of the native population. By our modern best estimates, over 90% of the natives of North and South America died because of diseases that were brought by Europeans. This then left the colonizing countries with a dilemma. They had found the rich resources that they needed for their mercantile system to make the other countries rich but they had a shortage of labor for extracting those riches to send back home. Slavery was already a well-known feature of life in North and South America, as native tribes enslaved each other, particularly after wars when they co might conquer some other tribe and take their warriors um, as slaves for the conquering um, group. The Europeans who came here took advantage of this to either capture or purchase people to be slaves for their enterprises. But as I already noted on a, the, one of the previous slides, this is only a partial solution because so many of the natives died from their contact with the Europeans that this was not a stable source of labor for them to extract the resources that they wanted to in order to become wealthy. This then led to them turning to the African slave trade. Africans, being from a continent that was connected to Europe and that had long had contact with Europeans, had been exposed to the same diseases as the Europeans. And so they were not wiped out by this contact. So Africans could be transported to the New World to provide the labor that Europeans wanted to extract the resources of the New World to accomplish their mercantilist purpose of making the mother countries rich. One nation in particular early on was most adept at this practice. That was the Portuguese. As we've discussed in a previous chapter, the Portuguese sought a new trade route to the east, which caused them to eventually find their way all the way around the tip of Africa. Along the way, they engaged in trade with the natives, selling durable goods to the natives, and what the natives had to provide in exchange was slaves. So Africans took their fellow African slaves and then they traded them to Europeans for various goods that the Europeans could bring, in this case, the Portuguese. The Portuguese then made use of these African slaves on sugar plantations that they were creating in islands out in the Atlantic Ocean. Sugar was a very sought after material in Europe that had been discovered and brought to Europe uh, across the Silk Road from the east where it had first naturally occurred. But it would not grow in Europe. So when the Portuguese figured out that they could grow it on more tropical islands in the Atlantic, then that gave them an opportunity to profit off of the sugar trade by raising it themselves rather than shipping it from the other side of the world. But the problem was that they needed labor for their sugary pl sugar 
production. They used the slaves from Africa to do this. They then transferred this system to the New World when they established colonies in it. First in Brazil, which became a Portuguese speaking part of South America. They also set up sugar plantations on islands throughout the Caribbean Ocean, which lies between South America and North America. And this became a standard practice throughout the Caribbean to establish slave, slavery as a means of providing labor for these vast sugar plantations. Now the slave, sort of slavery practice on these Caribbean sugar plantations was different than what would eventually be practiced in North America. They would work their slaves to death on these plantations, knowing that they could always get more from Africa. To make this possible, a, the first European building established in Africa, which was mentioned in a previous chapter, was Elmina Castle. This was a place where slaves could be gathered from the countryside and then put on ships to be shipped to the New World or back to Europe if they were to be used there. The slaves that were shipped across the Atlantic Ocean from the coast of Africa to colonies in North and South America were said to be traversing the Middle Passage. On this slide, we should see a diagram of how the slaves were packed into these ships in truly inhuman conditions. They were stacked one on top of another. Uh, they were chained down for the weeks that it took to travel. They were given minimal food. They had to just simply pee, pee, bleh, poop and pee where they were, vomit where they were, with whatever that came out of their bodies draining down to the, uh, on top of those who were stacked below them. It was truly horrible. Many of them died. But the slave traders figured out that even though they would have many die along the way, they could make more profit by stuffing as many slaves as possible onto their ship as they would make if they only brought a few in more healthy conditions. Why was this called the Middle Passage? Well, there's a couple of guesses of why. One is it was a middle portion of this triangle of trade that I've already described for you as I talked about the Atlantic world system and the mercantilist economic um, theory. Now remember the way this works is you have European countries that establish colonies in order to extract resources and then sell goods to them. So here in this diagram we have at the very top, we have raw cotton flowing to uh, Europe from the New World. We also have manufactured goods flowing to Africa from Europe. And we have enslaved Africans flowing from Africa to, the, to North America to work on the cotton plantations. So let's start this process in Europe. Europeans sail away to Africa. Well, they'll, they'll trade manufactured goods for slaves. That is the first passage. Then they will load up slaves and transport them to North America. That's the middle passage. Then after unloading the slaves, they'll load cotton onto their ships and take it to Europe to sell. That is the third passage. This rotation, this direction was because of the prevailing winds as ships were not powered back then other than by the wind. This is one possible meaning of the middle passage was it was the middle leg of this triangle of trade around the Atlantic. But there's an alter alternative theory of what the term Middle Passage really meant. For the slave, there were three distinct, distinct stages of them becoming the, uh, the slave that they would eventually be for the rest of their lives. The first of those stages was when they had been captured by some other tribe usually in Africa and then they would trek, in other words, walk from that inland place wherever this happened to the coast where they could be sold into slavery to the passing Europeans. This then was the first stage of them becoming a slave. Then they would board the ships to travel to the New World. This then was the middle stage or the middle passage. Once they were in the New World, then they had to pass through uh, a time that was called seasoning when they were converted into the slave they would be. First, their spirits as independent people had to be broken. Second, they had to be taught the, the culture and language that they'd be dealing with so they would be functional. So this would take some time. 
So again, the passage across the Atlantic is the middle step in this uh, process of becoming a slave, and that's possibly where the term middle passage came from. I am trying to record a lecture in here.
the center of the slave trade in what would eventually be the United States of America was in Charlestown, which would eventually be Charleston, in what would eventually be South Carolina, but this time was just the Carolinas. The Spanish were concerned about the growing British presence in the Carolinas. They had colonized Florida. And so to fight against the growing English presence in the Carolinas, the Spanish built a fortress in what is now St. Augustine, Florida. And they issued a decree of sanctuary that any slaves in the Carolinas or elsewhere who could escape to freedom in what is now Florida would be given sanctuary. They would not be enslaved as long as they converted to Catholicism and learned to speak Spanish. Now, they did this as a way to deprive the English colonists of the benefits of slavery, the economic benefits of slavery. It was a way to try to stop the British colonies from developing, which the Spanish saw as a threat to their own colonies. The slaves that were brought to serve in places like the Carolinas lived a different life than those that were taken to the sugar plantations of the Caribbean and Brazil. The slaves that were brought to North America had the highest rate of women among them and the highest number of children of any African slaves that were brought to the New World. The reason for this was because the British slaveholders didn't want to work their slaves to death and just buy new ones, like those who ran the brutal sugar plantations in the Caribbean. Instead, they wanted to raise slave families so that then they would have multi-generations of future slaves come from the original ones that they bought. Now, although they allowed the slaves to form families to produce children for them, they did not treat those families with the respect that you might think they would deserve. They would routinely sell members of the family off to other people who wanted slaves without any thought of breaking up husbands and wives or children from their parents. This sort of slavery that developed in North America is known as chattel slavery. And what is meant by that is the slave becomes the literal property of the slave owner. The person is considered an object to be bought and sold by them. Now, you may think, well, of course, that's what slavery is. But there are other forms of slavery. There is slavery which is just a labor bondage, for example, where you're required to work for a person, but you may actually go home to your own family at night. In matter of fact, your work might be for a certain amount of time, a certain number of years, and then your slavery is over, where all they do is own your effort for a certain amount of time without actually owning you. Well, this was not the case of the kind of slavery that was practiced in the British colonies. Instead, it was chattel slavery. The, owner of the, slave, the, the slave owner owned the slave as an object, which means anything produced by that slave belonged to them also, including their children. So this badge of slavery was inherited from generation to generation. This is one of the things that made it profitable to keep the slaves alive and have them bear children is because those children would then be future laborers for the slave owner. The next section covered in chapter three concerns English politics during this time period. To understand English politics during this time period, we have to first remember something that I discussed in a previous chapter, the Reformation. This time period during European history, when the Catholic Church broke up into various Protestant faiths. The Protestant Church that became uh, most dominant in England was known as the Church of England or otherwise known as the Anglican Church. Everybody who was in power in England was expected to be a member and a supporter of the Anglican Church. But a man became King of England named Charles I. He was considered to be a sympathizer to the Catholic Church, and he even married a princess from another country who was a Catholic. This left people in English suspicious of him. Then his um, uh, problems took a turn for the worse when he ended up in a conflict with Parliament. Parliament is something like the United States Congress. 
It's a group of people elected in England that at this time were put there to help the king run the country. And there was this debate around this time period about whether you even really needed to have a king if the parliament was capable of running the country. Well, this became particularly pronounced because of this worry that Charles I was secretly a Catholic in, an, in a country that was now Protestant, that he was not a true member of the Church of England. So one day he ended up in a conflict with Parliament over some money that he wanted to spend that they didn't want to allow him to spend. And that conflict boiled over into what became known as the English Civil War. Oliver Cromwell, the leader of Parliament, was opposed to Charles I, and they organized their own armies against each other. Eventually, Charles I was captured, and he was executed. And we had a brief time period thereafter in which Parliament ran England without a king. After the death of Charles I, his son, who had become known as the Charles II, went into hiding. Now, eventually, he would be restored to the monarchy, and the English Civil War would eventually be resolved with the monarchy being back in power after this time period with Parliament running everything. But during that time period in between the execution of Charles I and eventually the ascension of Charles II to the throne, there is this period of conflict and uncertainty, and this affected the colonies also because some of the colonies were set up with the, to be directly answerable to the king. Either they were royal colonies that were controlled by the king himself, or they were proprietary colonies where he had essentially chosen people to be in charge of them. In some cases, they were charter colonies where other groups were given authority to run things. But many of the colonies were directly loyal to the king. So at a time that the king is dethroned, then Parliament wants to be sure that the colonies are actually loyal to them, rather than Charles II, the man who would be king, who is in hiding. And to try to make sure that the colonies would remain loyal, the Parliament decided to crack down on them economically. This then led to the passage of a law in 1650 that created an embargo against colonies that they saw as disloyal. What embargo means is that the government in England refused to do business with those colonies. They weren't allowed to ship new goods in or ship goods out. It was an attempt to harm them economically and force them to swear their loyalty to Parliament. The next year, an additional step was taken, which um, crack down on all the colonies in a sense. It was called the Navigation Act of 1651. And this required any goods being shipped out of the colonies to be sold would have to be shipped on English ships and they would have to make port in England. So even if you wanted to send something to be sold to people in, I don't know, France, it would have to be sent to England first. This was a way for the English, the government of England, Parliament this time to keep a firm control on all the trade coming out of the colonies to try to force them to be loyal to the Parliament. But what eventually happened was Cromwell died, Charles II took power again, and then eventually his descendant James II came into power a few decades later. Now James II was actually a Catholic and this did not go over well in this Protestant country. So once again, Parliament rose up against the king. This event became known as the Glorious Revolution. Now they didn't execute James II, but they did run him out of the country. But interestingly, this time, rather than Parliament trying to take over and run the country, because they knew that there would be people out there that would still think that they should have a king, they decide to instead recruit a queen and king that they thought might work with them better. They sought out James II's nearest relative, a niece, who was not a Catholic, and they invited her to come become Queen of England. Her name was Queen Mary, and her husband, William of Orange, a Dutchman, 
was invited to come become the king also. And they accepted this, and they came to England to become the king and queen. But the parliament required them to agree to something first. They had to sign a document, which became known as the English Bill of Rights. The English Bill of Rights was a list of things that the king and queen agreed that they would not do, that they could not do without permission from parliament. So this was an important step toward empowering parliament and taking power away from the king or queen of England. This is one of those things that eventually had a great influence on the founding of the United States of America. As the colonists that came to settle here looked back at this English Bill of Rights and said, you know what, there's certain things that the king shouldn't be doing. And if he's doing them, he's not a good king and we have a justification to rebel against him. The next topic covered in chapter three concerns the colonies themselves. And the way I'm gonna work through this topic is I'm gonna take a few moments to talk about each colony, about how it was settled and when. The first English colony in the New World, as we discussed in the a previous chapter, was Virginia. Now they claimed Virginia several years before this, but the first colonists to actually settle in Virginia and establish a permanent colony was in Jamestown in 1607. We talked about Jamestown in the previous chapter, so we don't need to spend a bunch of time talking about it now. But just to note that this is founded by the Virginia Company. This is a group of people who came to America to make money, and eventually they did off of tobacco. The next English colony was founded in what is now Massachusetts. This was founded by the Puritans, people like the Pilgrims, who left England and came to America where they thought they could practice their religion in peace because they thought that even the Anglican Church wasn't pure enough. It wasn't closely enough following the teachings of the Bible, that it was still too Catholic in the way it conducted themselves. So Puritans came to America to set up their own colony to live their religious lives the way they thought they should without interference from the government. The next colony was also founded for religious reasons, but at the other end of this conflict between Catholics and Protestants. Now remember, we have a succession of kings in England, including Charles I, Charles II, and James II, who were either Catholics or sympathetic to the Catholics. So, while um, Charles I was in power, one of his good friends, a guy named Lord Baltimore, who was a Catholic, was given permission to create a colony in what is now Maryland. It was named after Charles I's wife, Mary. And so in 1632, the colony of Maryland was established specifically as a safe haven for Catholics, people who felt oppressed in England because it was a Protestant country and they remained Catholics, could travel and settle in Maryland as a place where they could practice their Catholicism safely. To the south, the Carolinas were also set aside for colonization. In 1629 is when the British laid claim to them, although it would be many years, not until in the 1650s that permanent colonies, excuse me, permanent settlements were set up. To begin with, South Carolina was primarily a place to raise indigo. It was a crop that was used to dye clothing blue. Later on, rice production would be important. Then eventually, um, cotton would become king in this area. But to begin with, the Carolinas was a place for indigo plantations. Now I say South Carolina here, to begin with it was just the Carolinas. Later on, as I'll identify in a moment, the state of, South, of North Carolina was split off from South Carolina. But to begin with, they were together as just Carolina. Back up in New England, where the Massachusetts colony was founded, a man named Thomas Hooker decided to take some settlers and move off into what is now Connecticut in 1636. They found a valley there where they thought they could be prosperous and have bigger farms, and this then became the colony of Connecticut. Rhode Island in the same region was founded in the same year, but for a different reason. 
rather than people just going off to find other economic opportunities. In this case, it was religion that again drove the founding of a new colony. A man named Roger Williams and a woman named Anne Hutchinson were religious leaders in Massachusetts, but they were considered too radical for even the other Puritans, who had been considered too radical for the people back in England who are members of the Church of England. So the Puritans came to America and among the Puritans were these people, Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson, who they thought were even a little more crazy with their religion. So they packed up and left and went to the place that is now known as Rhode Island. There in 1636, they set up their own colony and it was uh, primarily known for its dedication to religious freedom that anybody that wanted to practice whatever religious beliefs could come to Rhode Island and do it freely, including Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson. The next colony that we want to talk about was one that was not actually founded by the English, but was founded by the Dutch, specifically the Dutch West India Company, which was the, the Dutch company that was trying to get to India through the West. Uh, remember the, the previous chapter, we talked about them hiring Henry Hudson to try to find a Northwest Passage for them. They ended up establishing a colony in the New World because as they explored looking for a Northwest Passage, like the French, they ended up doing business with the Native Americans, particularly trading for things like furs. Now to make this more efficient, they thought they had to have a greater presence in the New World. So they set up a colony which became known as New Amsterdam and founded a city known as New Amsterdam. This colony was founded on the island of Manhattan in what would eventually become New York. In the previous chapter, we talked about how it was purchased from the natives there using wampum, uh, the beads and other trinkets. Eventually, the Dutch colonists would realize that their, col their colony could not be maintained because the British were forming colonies all around it. And the British were far more powerful than the Dutch. They had a bigger navy. They had more people. They were richer. And so they saw what was eventually going to happen, that their colony would be challenged militarily and eventually conquered. So they just gave it up peacefully instead. In 1664, New Amsterdam was turned over to the, the English. It was renamed New York after a place in England called York. The person who was given charge of it was a man named the Duke of York. The Duke of York was a, um, a brother to Charles II, who was the, the king, the Catholic King of England at the time. Um, the Duke of York then took charge of this colony in the New World, renamed it, it would eventually become uh, this powerful city of New York City and the powerful state of New York. Other areas that were claimed by the Dutch that were turned over to the English would become what we now know as New Jersey and Delaware. Part of this region, what they called East Jersey, was assigned by Charles II to his good friend, George Carteret, who in 1664 founded the English colony of New Jersey. The other part was assigned to an important Englishman named William Penn. Now, he was not one of these Catholic people or sympathetic to Charles II for religious reasons. Um, he was of a different religion. William Penn was a Quaker. Quakers were a different group of Protestants who were considered kind of extreme by the Church of England, kind of extreme by the Catholics, but they wanted a place where they could freely practice their religion. And William Penn was determined to find them a place like that in the New World. So first he got permission in 1664 to set up this colony in what was called West Jersey when the, the Dutch first had it and became the, the state of Delaware eventually in American history. So this little colony of Delaware was set up by William Penn in 1664 with permission of Charles II. 
William Penn eventually decided that wasn't good enough. So he petitioned and got permission from the king to set up an additional colony. This would become Pennsylvania, and he set it up in 1681 specifically as a safe haven for the Quakers. The Quakers were also known as the Society of Friends. They were a group without the same sort of formal leadership that other uh, religious groups would have. They would meet together, they said, as friends. And sometimes they would have such intense religious experiences that they would quake. This is why they became known as Quakers. They were a very tolerant group, though, of other faiths. So Pennsylvania also became a haven for religious freedom under William Penn. In 1729, finally North Carolina was split off from South Carolina to become one of the younger colonies. And then the last of the 13 original colonies that would eventually form the United States of America was founded in 1738. Now notice this is only about 40 years before the period of the American Revolution. That was the colony of Georgia. Georgia was founded by a man named James Oglethorpe. He was a minister, a very popular minister at the time, who wanted to set up a place where people who were in bondage in England for not being able to pay their debts could start a new life. And that's what Georgia was set up as, as a debtor colony. The next co topic covered in the chapter is conflict. In other words, the sort of difficult things that the colonists got into with other groups and amongst each other. Many of these conflicts were with native tribes. One of the earliest of these conflicts that could be called a war was the Pequot War of 1636 to 1637. This war came from power rivalries among Native Americans who were living around the British settlements forming in New England. So like, for example, the colony of Massachusetts, there were a bunch of people who came from England and settled there. And when they settled there, they realized that they needed to engage in trade with the remaining Native Americans to get things that they couldn't otherwise obtain, to try to get loyalty from them, things like that. Well, what happened was the native tribes competed with each other to have relationships with the new colonists coming from England. And this led to conflicts between the tribes themselves. Well, the English settlers would then get in the middle of these conflicts. And in this case, in the Pequot War, what they ended up doing was the British sided God, I pause here for a moment. I keep flipping the terms English and British back and forth. They're not exactly the same, but they're close enough for us to keep track of. We're talking about people from the the from Great Britain, which consists of those islands where England is part of it. Um, mostly, we're talking about English people, but we're also talking about, for example, Scottish people. Also, when we t use the term British. The terms aren't exactly the same, but I'll sometimes use them interchangeably because for the story of the founding of the United States of America, it really doesn't matter whether we're talking about Great Britain or England by itself. We're talking about a power over on the other side of Atlantic trying to influence things here in America. But in this case, you have these settlers that come from England, come from Great Britain. They settle in Massachusetts. They're having interaction with the, nat with the native tribes and the native tribes are competing for their attention, so to speak. Well, what happens is in these conflicts then, the English settlers side with a tribe called the Mohegans to go and fight against the Pequots. And the most famous horrible event in this was the Mystic Massacre. So the Pequots had a village and the, the English went and surrounded it, and then they set fire to it. And as the people tried to get out of it, they had it completely surrounded, they shot them and killed them. And they killed as many as 400 members of the Pequot nation doing this. And the report from the eyewitnesses was that only five people, not, not more than five people could have got away alive. That means they killed the warriors, they killed the women, they killed the children. They killed everyone, which is why it's called a massacre. But even though the Mohegans were on the side of the English in the Pequot War, a couple decades later, they end up being the adversaries. The Mohegans had a, a chief uh, known as Metacombe by them, 
where he was called King Philip by the British. And the report was that he was secretly planning an attack on the British. Well, when they found out about that, they ended up going to war with him early. And it's a big complicated thing that happened. Um, they got word that he was um, going to engage in this, this war. They sent people to check on it. The, the people got killed, etc. You don't need to know all those specifics. Just know that they went to war and they end up pursuing him for a long time before they were finally able to capture him. This shows how even when a tribe sides with the British, later on they can become the enemy of the British as different loyalties and needs change. When James II became King of England, he decided that all these various things going on amongst all these different colonies in this area um, were troublesome. They were all having their own little individual skirmishes with the natives, and so he tried to bring them together as a single colony, what he called the Dominion of New England, with a single administrative structure over it so that he could keep better track of it. Well, that didn't work very well. It ended up just upsetting the colonists as they felt this heavier hand pressing down upon them, which would be one of the things that would contribute to their changing attitudes that would eventually lead to the American Revolution. Another thing that was a problem during this time period is that when King James II created the Dominion of New England, he put a governor in charge of it, Sir Edmund Andros. And he decided that all these conflicts with the native tribes needed to be dealt with, but he needed an army to do that. So he engaged in a practice called impressment where people were essentially forced to join the army whether they wanted to or not. Well, again, this is one of these things that from the point of view of the colonists is viewed as an excess of government, the, the government not letting them live their lives, and it causes this rebellious spirit to begin to develop in the Americas against this government back in England and the governors that they were sending to be over them. A few years later, one of the more significant events in early colonial history happens in Massachusetts, which is famously known down in history as the Salem Witch Trials. Now, it didn't involve a lot of people, but it is such a shocking thing to have happen that it is very well known and seen as one of the more horrible things that happened during colonial history among the colonists themselves. What happened was there was a slave woman that lived among the people there in Salem, Massachusetts, named Hituwa. We aren't really sure who she was. We think that maybe she was of mixed ancestry, both Native American and African, but she was a servant woman and she got caught doing something bad and she tried to defect, deflect blame by claiming that somebody in the village was a witch who had put a curse upon her. Well. These were very superstitious people at this time, and they went to confront the person who Tatuba had claimed was a witch. And this began a series of accusations and recriminations, whereas people were accused of witchcraft, the way they sought to get out of it was to accuse somebody else of having put some sort of curse upon them. Well, by the time this, this horrible series of accusations had run its course, over 20 people had been executed in Salem and in other nearby towns for having practiced witchcraft, and several others would eventually die in prison from their sentences that had been put upon them for practicing witchcraft. Now, the truth is, is probably none of these people was actually practicing witchcraft, but it shows how a group of people can become hysterical and go on to do awful things. The next big conflict that we want to talk about took place in Virginia. And this is another one of these events where um, a series of mistakes leads to war. In this case, what happened was there was a man who was approached by some Native Americans to settle a debt. Um, he owed them money and he didn't have it. And so before they left, they stole one of his pigs or several of his pigs to pay for the debt. Now, from their point of view, they were just collecting what was theirs, although from his point of view, they were thieves. So a group of people, white people, 
went out to confront them and they were members of a of the dog tribe but as they went out to track them down confront them they came across some people from the susquehannock tribe and they didn't know they were from a different tribe and so they attacked them well, once the Susquehannock tribe had been attacked by the white settlers, then they attacked back, and this full war breaks out between them. Well, the governor of Virginia was a man named William Berkeley, and he decided the way to take care of this conflict with the Susquehannock was to fight a defensive war to essentially bring the settlers back in from the frontier a little ways, build a system of forts to defend against the natives, and kind of hunker down against the attacks. Well, he was considered to be corrupt for doing this by some people, since he gave out the contracts to build the forts to uh, his friends who had lands along the frontier so they could profit off of it. But there was another problem. And that was that settlers along the frontier, like this man in the, on the picture on the slide, Nathaniel Bacon, they didn't want to fight a defensive war. They wanted to go and take the war to the natives, to go and kill them on the frontier so that they couldn't be a threat to people like Nathaniel Bacon, who had land out on the frontier. So there was this conflict in Virginia politics at the time whether to fight the governor's um, defensive war or to fight a more aggressive war like Nathaniel Bacon wanted. Well, Nathaniel Bacon got elected to their little Congress, their legislature there in Virginia, which was known as the House of Burgesses. He got elected to their General Assembly, one of the people from the countryside to be elected to help make laws. He then took advantage of that to confront the governor about what needed to be done. And so he thought he had enough support to threaten the governor, to force the governor to make him a general over the armies of Virginia so he could then take the power of the state to go attack the natives on the frontier. Well, it didn't go quite the way he wanted. He confronted the governor. The governor stood strong against him, humiliated him. So then Nathaniel Bacon took it up a notch and said that he would get his followers to come and that they would kill everybody in the General Assembly. Well, at that time, the members of the House of Burgesses convinced the governor to give in and make him the general of the troops of Virginia. So he got his commission, he got his army, and he went out to then fight the natives. But it was somewhat of a hollow victory. You see, once he was gone, the governor decided that he was a rebel and he needed to be tracked down and defeated. And so you had Nathaniel Bacon's uh, rebellious army against the governor's official army. And as they're skirmishing with each other over the future of Virginia, what happens is the government back in England sends a Royal Navy with royal soldiers known as redcoats to come and take charge in the colony to bring stability to it to go settle things on the frontier with the natives and settle things among virginians themselves who are in a sort of a state of civil war with each other well this event exposed a basic problem with how the economy was develop developing in virginia and other similar places the problem was, is that many people had come to America as poor laborers, indentured servants we talked about in a previous chapter. Well, once they finish their, their indentured servitude, then they become free men. And they expect to go out and be able to make a living for themselves on the frontier. But then they're going to have conflicts. And this was leading to instability. They were getting too many people there to work the farms and the plantations who had a little bit too much free will to cause trouble afterwards. This then led to a transition in labor. If you're a big landowner, you don't want to bring in indentured servants anymore who once they earn their freedom are going to cause trouble. Instead, you start buying African slaves from the slave traders, from, from um, Holland, the Dutch slave traders, then eventually English slave traders because the slaves are your property. They are not going to become free one day and, and cause trouble. You can keep them enslaved their whole lives then to be your loyal laborers. Well, at the same time that these kind of conflicts are going on with the, the Native Americans in the English colonies, 
The Spaniards, in what would eventually become part of the United States of America, are experiencing their own problems in the Southwest, in what would eventually become Arizona and New Mexico. This is the area where the Pueblo Indians lived. We talked about them in a previous chapter. Well, the Spanish had set up their own colonizing effort there. They would founded the city of Santa Fe in New Mexico. But eventually, a leader rose up among the Pueblos, Pope was his name. And he led a revolt among them. And it wasn't a revolt just to drive the Spanish out, but to reclaim their culture. They had essentially been forced to, con to convert to the Catholic Church by the Spaniards who conquered them. And they wanted to regain their lands, their culture, and their religion. And they drove the Spanish out. This was one of the great victories of uh, Native Americans over um, European conquerors, but it was a short-lived victory. Eventually the Spanish returned armed and ready and they reconquered New Mexico and once again subjugated the Pueblos to their will. Another conflict in the colonies during this early time period between the settlers and the natives was the Yamasee War. This took place in the southeast of what would eventually be the United States of America. This was a dispute over trade. Again, the English are doing a bunch of, of buying and selling, bartering for things such as furs with the native population. And what they would do is they would enter into long-standing deals. You give us these furs, we give you these products in return. But these things had to be renegotiated from time to time. In this case, what happened was some envoys went out from the English to the Yamasee tribe to negotiate a new treaty, but the Yamasee had decided that they had been taken advantage of too much. And one of the ways they had been taken advantage of is many of their people had been enslaved to work for the English. And they decided it was time for rebellion, so they killed the envoys, and this then led to warfare with them. One of the things that made it possible for the English to win this war against the Yamasee tribe is that the Cherokee tribe sided with the English. The Cherokees were one of five, known, five tribes known as the civilized tribes, tribes that tried to adapt to at least some extent European ways of life. They settled down into towns, they took up agriculture, they developed written languages, they even published newspapers, things like that. They thought they could do that and ingratiate themselves to the European colonists and not get conquered like they saw other tribes were being conquered. So they actually sided with the British during this time period to help the British win the war against the Yamasee. But the outbreak of this war with the Yamasee, which was in part due to the fact that too many Yamasee were being taken as slaves by the British, then led to another pressure to switch from native slave labor to African slave labor. Now, why would this be better? Well, because when you have African slaves, their relatives are on the other side of the Atlantic. You can't have some brother or father or cousin decide to show up to free his relative that's been enslaved by you because the relatives are on the other side of the ocean. So if you want slaves, rather than taking them from the Native American tribes in the area, you get them from slave traders who bring them in from Africa. So these pressures then lead to lots more African slaves being brought in and the population of Africans in what would eventually become the United States of America growing significantly. The last conflict to tell you about in this chapter concerned a land deal in Pennsylvania. So there were some um, white men that wanted to buy tribal land from the Delaware tribe. Now, the Delaware tribe is the tribe from which the state of Delaware gets its name, but they didn't just live in Delaware. They also lived in what is present day Pennsylvania and they claimed a big chunk of the land there as their own. Well, the white people wanted to buy some of it from them. And the deal that they reached was that the Delaware would send, sell as much land as a person could walk in a day and a half. So they had a starting point and then a person was supposed to walk for a day and a half, stop, and however they far they got to, then that was the land that would be sold to the whites. <laughs> 
Well, what happened was the people engaging in this land deal, they hired a string of runners and they created trails, either pre-existing trails or they went out and created new trails for them to run smoothly. And they had them run as far and as fast as they could in a relay. So in the 18 hours of daylight that they were able to run, they actually covered 55 miles when it was expected that they would only cover a few miles. Well, when the, the Delaware saw what had happened, that essentially the game had been rigged to take a lot more of their land than they had ever been expecting to give up. Rather than fight it, because they knew that they would lose if they were to fight, instead they packed up in mass and left. They moved to the Ohio area to get away from the whites. Well, this was only a temporary solution to their problem, because as the native tribes continued to dwindle in both numbers and in power, the settlers coming in from Europe, particularly from England, continued to increase in numbers and power. And it would only be a matter of time before the natives were completely conquered and moved out of the way by the Europeans that were coming. And that does it for chapter three in American Yop.